This week on Vaticano, step inside St. Peter's Basilica for the ordination to the diaconate of 15 young men from North America and discover the incredible journey they've undertaken. Join us as we explore the spiritual legacy of St. John Henry Newman and don't miss our special feature on the beauty and devotion of Our Lady of the Rosary. Vaticano starts now. On October the 7th, 2023, Hamas stormed the border with Israel. This week marks the one year anniversary of the attack, which unleashed a spiral of violence in the Middle East. The militant groups kidnapped more than 251 people, including the American Hirsch Goldberg Poland. When the young man's body was found in early September, the Pope offered words of condolence to his mother, Rachel. He worries about all of these innocent hostages and all the innocent Palestinian civilians who are in a very dangerous place right now. On the eve of the anniversary of this attack, members of the Synod of Bishops and faithful around the world joined Pope Francis in praying the Rosary for peace. From the Papal Basilica of St. Mary Major, the Pontiff asked the Virgin, patroness of Rome, for the protection of those suffering the consequences of war. Turn the hearts of those who feel hatred. Silence the noise of the weapons that causes death. Extinguish the violence that resides within men and inspire peace initiatives in the decisions of those who govern the nations. The Pope prayed for the oppressed because of injustices and highlighted the pain of those who mourn the death of their own children. He also called for a day of prayer and fasting on October the 7th to pray for an end to conflicts in the world, as he has done for Syria, Lebanon, Afghanistan, Ukraine, and the Holy Land throughout his pontificate. On this occasion, he sent a letter to Christians in the Holy Land, inviting them to be witnesses of a peace without weapons. In it, the pontiff expressed solidarity with those who have left their homes, schools, and jobs to escape the bombs and with mothers whose children are injured or who have died. The Holy Father assured his closeness to those who have no voice in this conflict, noting that much is said about plans and strategies, but little is said about the actual situation of those who suffer. Furthermore, on Sunday, October the 7th, after the Angelus Prayer, the Pope appealed to the international community to intervene in halting the spiral of revenge that fuels the war in the Middle East. Let us not forget that there are still many hostages in Gaza for whom I call for their immediate release. Since that day, the Middle East has plunged into increasingly severe suffering, with destructive military actions continuing to affect the Palestinian population. The Church continues to advocate on behalf of all those caught in the crossfire, urging the international community to heed Pope Francis's call for peace and reconciliation and to work tirelessly towards ending the cycle of violence and restoring hope to the suffering. I am pleased to announce that on December 8, I will hold the consistory for the appointment of new cardinals. Their origin reflects the universality of the Church that continues to announce God's merciful love to all people.
Pope Francis announced on Sunday that he will create 21 new cardinals, including the archbishops of Tehran, Tokyo, and Toronto, at a consistory on December the 8th. The 87-year-old Pope made the announcement from a window overlooking St. Peter's Square after the Angelus Prayer on October the 6th. The new cardinal designates highlight the Pope's focus on the global peripheries, with appointees coming from countries such as Peru, Ecuador, Iran, Japan, Ivory Coast, Algeria, and Serbia. Notably, aside from a few Italians, only two new cardinals, Dominican preacher Timothy Radcliffe, former Master General of the Dominican Order, and Archbishop Francis Leo of Toronto, hail from the West. This underscores Francis's ongoing effort to shift the Church's leadership from being primarily Western to more global. Since his election in 2013, Pope Francis has created 142 cardinals from 70 countries across nine consistories. The most recent was held on September the 30th, 2023. 15 members of the College of Cardinals have turned 80 since the last consistory, losing their right to vote in a future papal election. Following the December consistory, the College of Cardinals will have 141 electors, 111 of whom, or 79%, have been appointed by Pope Francis, barring any unforeseen deaths. Welcome to this week's Vaticano Updates, the most important news from the Holy Father and the Vatican. The second session of the Vatican Synod on Synodality is underway. A cornerstone of Pope Francis's papacy, it began on October the 2nd. One of the topics discussed last year is the role of women and the possibility of female deacons. However, Cardinal Victor Manuel Fernandez, the prefect of the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, has already said that women deacons are not being considered, at least for now. Follow our daily updates on the Synod on EWTN and at EWTNVatican.com. The Feast of the Rosary was celebrated on Monday, October the 7th, with Pope Francis urging Catholics worldwide to pray the Rosary for peace and an end to war. In this dramatic hour, the Pope said, as the winds of war and fires of violence devastate nations, the Christian community is called to serve humanity. On October the 10th, Taiwan celebrated its National Day, making, marking its 113th anniversary. Taiwan's ambassador to the Holy See, Matthew Lee, called for decisive and concrete actions to secure peace, quoting Pope Francis. The Holy See has had diplomatic ties with Taiwan for 82 years, but does not maintain relations with the People's Republic of China. Be open to the gift of life, Pope Francis urged married couples in his Sunday Angelus Address. Recalling a recent meeting with a father of eight, the Pope called it a great consolation. Speaking from the Apostolic Palace on October the 6th, he encouraged couples to reflect on their openness to children. Pope Francis has repeatedly voiced concern over Europe's demographic winter, with countries like Italy facing historically low birth rates. St. Peter's Basilica has announced the completion of the restoration of St. Peter's Baldachin, which stands above the main altar and marks the tomb of the Apostle Peter as well as the chair of St. Peter in the chapter hall. The restored work of Bernini will be unveiled on October the 27th. Thank you again for watching this week's Vaticano Updates in Rome. Andreas Tonhauser for EWTN Vaticano. In a few moments, join us in St. Peter's Basilica for the ordination to the diaconate of 15 seminarians from the Pontifical North American College. Receive the gospel of Christ, whose herald you have become. Believe what you read, teach what you believe, and practice what you teach. A big day in Rome on Thursday, October the 3rd. 
15 seminarians from the Pontifical North American College from across the United States were ordained deacons in St. Peter's Basilica. Archbishop Alexander Sample from the Archdiocese of Portland, Oregon, presided over the celebration in front of around 1,500 attendees. He shed his blood for his bride, the church. During his homily, the Archbishop thanked the families for the gifts of their sons, now given to the church, and reminded the young men of their new identity, an image of Christ, the true servant. Believe what you read, teach what you believe, and practice what you teach. One of the biggest moments is when Bishop handed on to us the book of the Gospels, and I literally felt the weight of, this is my responsibility, that Jesus Christ would be proclaimed now. The first deacons were seven men chosen to serve the early Christian community during its rapid growth, addressing concerns that some widows were being neglected. The apostles appointed them so they could focus on preaching the gospel as Christ had commanded. So they gathered the rest of the disciples together, explained their dilemma concerning the neglected widows, and asked them to, quote, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this duty. Acts 6.3. You're in this grand basilica. It's over the tomb of the Prince of the Apostles, Peter. It's the place of the popes, and who am I to be worthy to be ordained here at St. Peter's. Um, it's, it was just such an incredibly humbling experience. The saints feel so distant, but in reality, they're even more alive than my closest friends and family on earth. And I think Rome like closes the gap a little bit uh, with that teaching that can seem being ordained in Rome is a reminder that uh, I can't do this ministry myself. Deacons today continue in this tradition. The name itself comes from the Greek to serve, and deacons exercise this service in a variety of ways. I'm very excited to preach. The message that God gives us to preach, I mean the gospel, um, it passes through us and converts us. And then it overflows to the people that God is calling to him. I, I can't imagine a more exhilarating life than that. Part of the deacon's ministry is preaching the gospel. For these newly ordained men, this responsibility is not just a duty, but a profound joy. For me, as we approach the diaconate ordination, it's a real moment of joy, but a moment of peace. Preparation for holy orders begins before seminary, as a man deepens his relationship with God and discerns a possible calling to the priesthood. Formal preparation in seminary lasts five to seven years focusing on study, pastoral work, sacramental ministry, and growing in prayer. About seven years ago, I felt the, felt the grace to pray to God, uh, do whatever you want with me. And I had no idea what I was asking at the time. I feel like he's doing that. He's leading me along a path. Leading up to ordination, however, the preparation intensifies. Here are some of the events that will occur in the months before ordination. Application for orders, prayer, a fraternity weekend, summer assignment, and retreat. Throughout his time in seminary, a seminarian discerns whether God is calling him to the priesthood, while the church also discerns his vocation. Just as marriage requires mutual consent, ordination requires both the seminarian and the church to agree. It's a scary thing to lay your life down, and that was the case until I laid prostrate on the floor. Coming up from that, I was surprised at the amount of joy, the amount of peace, the amount of rest uh, that I felt. As they lay prostrate on the marble floor in St. Peter's Basilica, these men symbolized their total surrender to God. Rising up, they entered into a new chapter of their vocation with peace and renewed purpose. I could hear the church praying for me and I felt like, yeah, I was floating on this cloud of witnesses, this cloud of prayers. You think you know what that ordination mass and that liturgy is gonna be like, and then God just makes it so much greater. Um, I just feel this great sense of peace and gratitude to Almighty God for his invitation to me to follow him in this life. Now ordained as deacons, these men have embraced the call to serve Christ and his church with their entire lives. Looking ahead, 
They know their journey will bring both challenges and profound grace. Trusting in Christ's promise, I am with you always until the end of the age. Five years ago, in front of thousands of pilgrims gathered in St. Peter's Square, Pope Francis declared Cardinal John Henry Newman a saint. A brilliant academic, poet, and theologian, and one of the most charismatic figures of the 19th century, Newman left an indelible mark on his time. Born in England in 1801, he was raised in an Anglican family. At just 24, he was ordained an Anglican priest serving for over two decades as a clergyman and professor at Oxford's Oriel College. A devoted high churchman, he upheld the Anglican Church's continuity with ancient Christian tradition. But how did such a prominent figure in Anglicanism come to embrace the Catholic faith? Together with Father Hermann Geisler, director of the Newman Center in Rome, we explore this pivotal question. He knew that the Church of Rome was the mother of the church in England, because who had sent missionaries to England to proclaim the good news? It had been Pope Gregory the Great, of course. So Newman knew that Rome was the mother of the Church of England. But on the other hand, he was convinced, as most Anglicans at that time, that the Pope was the Antichrist, and that the Catholic Church was a heretic church, and uh, that they adored, he thought, uh, Our Lady and the Saints. So he had mixed feelings. During his first trip to Italy in 1833, a pivotal event occurred that would mark a turning point in Newman's journey towards Catholicism. And there he got very sick. He got uh, typhus and he thought that we, he would have to die. So he cried out in his delirium, I will not die, I will not die because I have not sinned against the light. He could never really explain what he meant by these words, but somehow he had experienced the closeness of God. In 1833, inspired by Newman, the Oxford movement was founded. Its goal was to highlight the Catholic elements within the English religious tradition and to spark a revival in the Church of England. Newman quickly became a leader of the movement. However, in 1845, after deep study of the Church Fathers and the early centuries of Christianity, Newman came to believe in the errors in Anglicanism and made a life-changing decision to convert to Catholicism. He wanted to Catholicize the Anglican Communion, but what he realized was that that was not approved by the University of Oxford, where he was professor, and that was not approved by the bishops, the Anglican bishops in England. So he decided to retire in a short, in a simple uh, place at the periphery of Oxford. And there for four years, he studied, he prayed, he fasted, just asking the Lord, show me the way where to go. Rome was Newman's destiny. By retracing his steps through the Eternal City, we can uncover the path of his vocation, visiting the places where he lived, studied and prayed. In 1846, Newman's bishop sent him to Rome to prepare for ordination. He entered the Missionary College of Propaganda Fide, located in Piazza di Spagna, as England was then considered a mission country. Newman spent a year there, and at the very beginning of his stay, he had a remarkable encounter. Already the Pope, uh, uh, Pius IX, who was Pope when Newman came to Rome for the second time, he visited Newman even in his college. Imagine, on one day the Pope knocked at his door and then he opened it. He was amazed that the Pope came to visit him because uh, Pope uh, Pius IX had heard about Newman, about that convert, and he wanted to ask him how, how he felt here in Rome. So it was quite special. In November of 1846, the Oratory of San Filippo Neri at Chiesa Nuova, in the heart of Rome, became Newman's new home. He longed to live in community with other priests while engaging in pastoral ministry, and the oratory deeply inspired him. 
After his ordination to the priesthood in Rome in 1847, Newman returned to England and established the English Oratory of San Filippo Neri in Maryvale, Birmingham. Newman's final visit to Rome came in 1879 at the personal invitation of Pope Leo XIII, the newly elected pope. Having previously served as nuncio in Brussels with oversight of church affairs in England, he was well aware of Newman's significant influence in the country. Pope Leo XIII wanted to create him a cardinal. He called him Il Mio Cardinale, my cardinal. He knew Newman's story and Newman's influence uh, because he has been a nuncio in Brussels for many years and there he has also been in charge for the development of the church in England. He knew about Newman's importance and when he was elected Pope in 1878, he decided immediately to make Newman a cardinal. Il mio cardinale, he always used to say. So Newman first was not, was not very happy because he was afraid that he had to go to Rome then, but he wanted to stay in England. But the Pope then let him know that he could remain, of course, in Birmingham in his oratory. And the Pope just wanted to honor Newman, to honor the Catholic Church in England. So then Newman gladly accepted. Newman had a unique relationship with the popes and the city of Rome. In a symbolic way, he returned once more, five years ago, when Pope Francis elevated him to sainthood in St. Peter's Square. We'll be back after a short break with a special segment on Our Lady of the Rosary. Pontifical Shrine of the Blessed Virgin of the Rosary in Pompeii is one of Italy's most important pilgrimage sites. Situated at the foot of the volcano Vesuvius, its beauty and spiritual significance draw over three million pilgrims every year. They come from all over the world to encounter the Virgin Mary and her son by praying the rosary. It is a prayer rooted in the gospel, in the word of God. It is entirely composed of God's Word. The Our Father, the Hail Mary, which includes part of the angel's announcement and the words of Elizabeth. Then there is the doxology, the glory be. Every 10 Hail Marys, we contemplate a different passage from the Gospel. The sanctuary of Pompeii was founded by Bartolo Longo at the end of the 19th century. Ordained a satanic priest, Bartolo was later convinced by a friend to abandon Satanism and discovered the Virgin Mary and the Rosary through a Dominican priest. With the help of Countess Mariana di Fusco, he inaugurated a confraternity of the Rosary and started restoring the shrine of Our Lady of Pompeii. Pompeii is also a place of profound spiritual conversion. So, who has passed through here? We've had many saintly pilgrims visit Pompeii. Just think of St. Francis Xavier Cabrini, the patron saint of migrants who came here, as well as St. Maximilian Kolbe and Blessed Carlo Acutis, soon to be canonized. Many popes have visited the shrine in the last decades. In 2008, Benedict XVI brought the Virgin Mary a golden rose, and in 2015, Pope Francis gave her a beautiful golden rosary. In their footsteps, millions of faithful traveled to Pompeii, to pray at the feet of Our Lady of the Rosary and for the canonization of Bartolo Longo, who was declared blessed in 1980 by Pope St. John Paul II. This is the Pope we all share. A canonization, of course, means that any saint is presented as a model for the Universal Church. Now, Bartolo Longo is known worldwide as there are many churches dedicated to Our Lady of Pompeii across the Americas, Asia, Europe, and even Africa and in the Middle East. And indirectly, these churches also honor Bartolo Longo. 
The sanctuary of Pompeii remains an important symbol of Marian devotion and is a place where many seek spiritual solace, healing, and inspiration. Pilgrims and faithful are encouraged to pray the supplication to Our Lady of Pompeii, a powerful prayer written by Bartolo Longo and recited by millions around the world.